April 20, it's April 26, 2022, planet Earth. Um, this is the incarnation overview. So uh, let's have a let's have a prayer. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for this evening. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that you are Lord of all, that you sent Jesus on our behalf. Father God, we thank you for um, uh, sending uh, your son, Father God, to take on flesh, to die for our sins, to make propitiation for our sins. Uh, we thank you and we praise you, Lord. Help us, O Lord, to absorb this material, Lord, that's central to the gospel message. Lord God, that we may be able to uh, disseminate it and um, expound upon it, Lord, uh, to others to proclaim it uh, freely and boldly in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so I figured, um, so th there are th essentially three, like maybe you could call them the uh, triumvirate or the trident or the three times and a fork um, prongs to uh, the gospel message. Um, at some point I'll put up a, a diagram of, um, maybe like an onion and where this fits, but the gospel message, you know, there's all these kind of doctrines and, um, secondary tertiary issues, even though some people make them first, you know, they put everything, they lump everything together, but some, you know, so if you strip everything out, what is the core message of the good news? Um, what's needed? to believe in Jesus, to, um, to live the Christian life. You know, of course, the, these others, other doctrines and teachings are um, like a supporting cast. They help you to grow and they help you to understand the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, at the core, what is it that um, if you didn't know anything else and you need to know just what the, what the central message is at the center of the onion, um, that would be the incarnation, that we're going to start talking about today, the atonement and the resurrection. Misael, yeah. can I say something really quick? Go ahead. Uh, because I was, I happened to stumble on this video and they were talking about exactly this, which I'm sure you you're cover, but that I forgot what they called it, mono, mono something, Korean or something like that. One of a famous pastor, I'm not going to say who it is, but he was saying that instead of, um like the trinity right he was saying and he's very famous too he was saying that is god manifested three ways but not like like they're separate they're not one do you have you heard about this mono mono something i'll send you the video no unless you talk about mono visit no, it was like monocleism or some or something like that. That that it was like, and it's, uh, I think the church is called like one oneness yeah. or something like yeah. that. Have you heard it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. That's yeah, that's oneness Pentecostal. That's not. Uh -huh. the um, they also go by apostolic, Jesus only. Um, some of them don't like those terms anymore, so they they're calling themselves apostolic. Um, oh. Yeah, that they they're opposed to the trinity they they believe pretty much what other religions believe even outside of um but in a different sense so in, in essentially in that system that's not what we're talking about but we, we go briefly go over that okay no never mind i thought it, it related so it's fine. no the, no well you, you it well i'll say it briefly you, you have i mean we could, take, we could take up that topic another time but you, you have the trinity which is uh god is um one essence one nature and then in three distinct persons or personalities, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and each of them are equal in understanding and eternality. So like the Holy Spirit resides in you and probably, uh, I don't know, call you call it a dirty secret, you know, it's, it's sort of secret that's never spoken about, but uh, a lot of people think the Holy Spirit is not really, you know, God the way the Father is or the Son is, but he's equally God, you know, whatever the Father knows, he knows, whatever the son loves, he loves, and so forth. Um, so those, they're distinct in oneness or apostolic um, teaching is, is by role. So when Jesus was on earth, he was playing the role, he, was, he took on the role of the son. And, um, but you know, it gets tricky 
it gets tricky because then, you know, especially everybody brings up this point when Jesus was being baptized, you know, was he a ventriloquist that he was calling out to himself, you know, this is the father when it's really him and the Holy Spirit is that, you know, he's a dove. So how did he, you know, do that trick? Um, so yeah, it, there is a famous pastor out there. That's why it doesn't matter whoever is famous, whatever, you just have to know the word for yourself. Um, so people just go by what they learned and they just keep it going and they never actually, you know, go to ground zero, which is what we're, we're doing here and try to try to see if these things are even in scripture before you even try to make a, um, a doctrine. So speaking to that, um, as we talk about the incarnation, we're going to define that in a moment, but the early church, even in the Bible, a lot of times when the Bible says something, it doesn't tell you how that came about, right? We're told that Jesus was born in Mary, right, by the work of the Holy Spirit, but it doesn't say exactly how that happened. Um, you know, it doesn't get all scientific. Uh, we probably couldn't understand it anyway. It was a work of God, but it was bona fide, uh, a living being. So well, we, we're going to talk about that in um, um, afterwards. We're just doing an overview tonight of it. Um, so anyway, the incarnation, as I said, the incarnation, the atonement, I'll define these briefly, and the resurrection is central to the good news of the gospel. These other things like, um, do you have to believe in the Trinity uh, to be saved? Um, no, you may not know that. Some people say, yeah, you do. But what about the thief on the cross? Right? In Luke 23, 43, Jesus says to him, today you will be with me in paradise. He didn't know anything about that. Um, he didn't really know it entirely who Jesus was, but he knew that he was something special, um, that he had some kind of authority and that was enough. You know, he had the light that he had. This is also in Romans. You can see this in Romans one twenty and Romans chapter one. Um, some people argue this, but we're not going into that right now. So what is the incarnation? So the incarnation, and again, the following weeks, we'll, I'll detail it out. I'll, I'll show some slides, but the incarnation, it comes from a Latin term. Um, uh, in carne, which means in flesh, and is central to our understanding of what Jesus did and who he is. The, uh, the atonement um, is the work that Jesus did. And that was the old, there was a, they didn't have a term for it, and there's a reason for that, but we're not talking about that tonight, but um, we could do that as another series, because that's also, that's, that's right at the, at the center. This is the work that Jesus did on the cross and everything that he did for us, the justification and what was going on behind the scenes and how this ties back to the Old Testament and going forward in our relationship to God. So they didn't really have a word for this. This is all like in the Middle Ages. So they came up with, they said, well, what's he doing? He's, he's making us one, at one meant, you know? So that's where that comes from, at, at one meant, atonement. Um, of course, like everybody else, well, like others do, they take this too far. And there's some um, sort of liberals or mystical religions where they take this, hey, we can be one with God, you know, mm, you know, that's not what that means. Um, it's a way to express something that's in scripture that has two meanings. Um, and then there's the resurrection. Without the resurrection, we would not know that we were um, saved, that we were forgiven. Um, if Jesus had not been raised from the dead, how would we have known or trusted that he had done his work? He's still in the ground. And even if he did, thank you, but that's only in this life. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15, 19 says, If in Christ we hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. In other words, we're pathetic. There's, there's no hope. There's no joy. Forget about those that went before us about going to see them because we're not going to see them. So... Um, the incarnation that is the son of God. That's what we're talking about tonight. Uh, the, we're just doing an overview and then I'll throw a bunch of stuff out and then we'll start sifting it, you know, going forward. But just so we get some terminology and, and um, some of the passages um, that, that speak of this. this. This is stuff we need to know that the son of God comes down and essentially and he becomes human. This, this is going to explain a lot when you read some passages in scripture that says that he knew, he didn't know, what did he know? People, you know, people challenge you on this. I thought if he's God, what did he know? Or if he died, did God die? Those kind of things like that. Um, 
so that he, the son takes on human form, uh, takes on human nature, and he does everything um, that he was supposed to do according to, this all comes back to the law. We'll, we'll, we'll leave those for in the future. But he, he had to accomplish a, a checklist of things. And in order to do these things, um, he had to become as one of us. And not only that, but even throughout after the resurrection, um, when he is exalted, um, there's a whole bunch of rituals that he still goes through. And in fact, and he's exalted, he's lifted up, he's given a name that is above every name. Uh, we're going to go over that today a little bit. And he continues to intercede for us before the Father. So, um, but you say, wait a minute, but he is God already. What was the, remember he has, well, remember, we, that's what we're talking about. He has um, two natures. So this is this, this, the central gist of, uh, of what's happening. So you have Father, um, Son, and Holy Spirit. The, the Father is God, fully God. The Son is fully God, and the Holy Spirit is fully God. It's not three gods, it's one God. It's one essence. Maybe you could think of it, it is, whatever example people give is they're all imperfect, you know, because God is a different being. So we're using human language as best we can understand it. You may want to maybe think of it as um, God's essence, let's say, it's, let's say a soul, right? Um, we're a soul, we're an embodied soul. So we have a body that's governed by a soul um, that has different compartments like spirit and thoughts, um, uh, sensations and other things like that. So God is one essence with three personalities, okay, or three persons. And the, the second person doesn't mean that the second, like, you know, he's number one, that, not that kind of thing. Um, the second person of the Trinity or triunity, uh, doesn't matter, the, the second person, um, it could have been the third person, it could have been the first person, but it just happens to be the second person is the one that came and took on flesh. The second person, so this is important. Um, I'll put these, I'll put these in slides, but it wouldn't hurt to to write it down or take it in. The more you hear it, maybe it, it sticks. The second person, so the Father is divine, right? The first person is divine, uh, a divine person with a divine nature. The second person is divine with a divine nature. The third person is divine with a divine nature, right? So, um, so the second person already pre-existed. That's the first passage we're going to hit today. The second person pre-existed. So we are human persons. So Jesus was not a human person. He was a divine person with a human nature. But more than that, before that, because he pre-existed, the second person with a divine nature added a human nature. Okay, so that's important to distinguish. Because a lot of heresies came out of that. Um, there's a bunch of heresies that, that came out because of people were trying to figure out what was what. The Bible doesn't start off and it doesn't tell us. Uh, this is the th this is the uh, the doctrine. People figured it out, and the Lord does this on purpose. <laughs> um, he doesn't always give you all the answers. It's like if you're interested, you you search the scriptures. But they didn't have to do that so much as they had to live it out. And as they were living it out, the Lord was, you know, giving them dreams and visions and prophecies and so forth because they were starting up the movement. And they began to see the scriptures just like Jesus did with them. Remember, what's key here is that Jesus is the one that started this in Luke 24, 44, and 45. He read the scriptures to them. He did the same thing with the two disciples to Emmaus in Luke 24. If you remember, Clopas and the other guy, um, which we don't have his name. And he went through the scriptures with them. It says he went through the law, the uh, the Psalms and the prophets, you know, the whole the whole thing. And he pointed out um, who the Messiah was, what he was supposed to do. They already knew scripture, but he, he, he hit all the dots and they all got it because they already had it in them. So that gives us a clue that the more you um, take in of God's word, when you begin to hear things, some things will make sense and other things are like, no, that's not right. Or other things, oh, that's what that means. And then you add that to the mix, you know, and then there's always more understanding and so forth. But what we have to get clear is the incarnation that Jesus came, the second person is divine. He already had a, a divine nature and he added a human nature. 
Um, also, it wasn't just that he, there's also, these are also heresies, that he, heresy mean um, false teaching. Um, some believe, some would, would say, and some still say, that, um, okay, that he took on the human nature, and as soon as he got to the cross, he chucked it. You know, because God can't suffer, God can't die. Um, and of course God can't die, and, and God did not die. Um, Jesus died in his humanity, the body died, right? But the body is what dies. We don't die. Um, so, oh, the soul does not die. Um, it could die. Our souls could die. But it doesn't die. It continues on. It continues on, you know, for, for bliss or for, you know, for suffering. So, that's key. Um, we're going to but keep it with the, let, let's just uh, maybe read, uh, let me share my screen. Um, what happened? Here we go. So let's go to uh, what's this? Let's go to John. So there's a bunch of passages, but let's just as an overview, just to um, just acclimate to the topic. Okay, so there are a few things to see here. So so there's a number of passages that that go over this that start giving you and the early church a clue as well and one of them is John uh, the first 18 verses so uh, you know John is the most popular book in the New Testament right so you always see them in the little booklets and it's actually it's my favorite book as well um, but usually when you get it's only really after you get to the you know after the first two verses because it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. I mean, what's the word? What is that? What's this business? Um, we'll just do, I, I, like I said, we're just doing an overview today. The word, um, it's not the letters, the letters of a word. Word um, in the old Hebrew and Greek by this time meant several things. It meant wisdom. It also meant the emanation of God. Um, so first of all, what we have to see is that when it says in the beginning, pretty much all scholars agree, um, I don't know if scholars, what scholars disagree, that this phrase, again, we have it in English, but in the Greek, that this phrase comes from Genesis 1-1, in the beginning. And what John is doing here is saying, this, what we're going to see as this person, right, obviously it's capitalized, but it doesn't, you know, it's not capitalized in Greek. But if you just read it, it's trying to mimic Genesis 1-1. Just like in Genesis 1, 1, it says in the beginning, or says in beginning, um, here is the same thing. Um, it says that whatever this this was, this was in the beginning. In other words, before anything was created, that's the way it, it was understood. So um, it says in the beginning was the word. And we're going to touch on this right in a moment. Uh, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. That is alluding back to Genesis 1, 1. Um, no one was with God, but God himself, right? So this is one of the things where they began to understand that somehow we're going to see over here, verse 14, as we keep reading, that this word, or what this is, this logos, that's a Greek word, um, it's, it's not a thing, it's an actual person. And we keep going I'm just gonna jump around a little bit we get to verse 14 and it says and the word so if you swap out for Jesus right but we, you know we're, we're jumping ahead and the word became flesh so took on humanity that's 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 what that means it, you know it's not like it means like you know meat uh, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory glory as of the only son from the father Full of grace and truth. Well, first of all, where does that even come from? Um, what, what do we even have this in the Old Testament? What it talks about is the, you know, the, the Messiah. But here we're getting into some other language. Full of grace and truth. Well, God is truth. Um, John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me. Wait a minute. This is crazy. Um, in other words, he's, if Jesus said the same thing, if you recall, right? When he was talking in John 8. When he says, before Abraham was, I am. 
He even says that Isaiah, remember Isaiah 6? Jesus says, Isaiah saw my glory. Um, so, of course, they wanted to kill him. And they, they, they did try to kill him. He had to get away from them. Um, in verse 18, it says, no one has ever seen God. And this was understood. It was clear. Nobody did, did see God. No one has ever seen, remember Moses in the mountain? No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is... So this has also been in contention. Uh, we'll read this in a moment. The only God who's at the Father, this is the English Standard Version. The only, and we'll read the King James in a moment. The only God who's at the Father's side, he has made him known. So no one has ever seen God, but there is a God. Uh, the early translation, that, you know, by the time that the King James in the 1600s that they had, read, no man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, and some still like still like that, like the New American Standard Version, and that's fine. That's not going to hurt anything. I'll tell you in a second. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He has made him, declared Him. Um, but they, no one understood this to be. Um, this was a, a big bone of contention in the next few hundred years. Like, how did this work? Who was the Son exactly in relation to God? Um, other manuscripts later on, or earlier than than the one in the King James. Um, even a new international version has and no one has ever seen god but the one and only son who is at who is himself god so they're even clearer in the new international version um but that's more of a study i mean that that's uh people bicker and, and argue about that so who's this word um let's just see what this word does and then we'll go in fact you can see the see over here where they'll bring you back to genesis um we don't have to go there yeah, you could you could do that um but let's just see who this word is in a second, then we're going to go to the Old Testament for a moment uh, somewhere else. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Remember we said there's the Father, there's the Son, and there's the Holy Spirit. Or the first person who's divine, the second person is divine, the third person is divine, and each of them have a divine nature. Um, so when Jesus comes down, he takes on a human nature. Now he has two natures. He has a divine nature, which was already he was already fully divine, and he also has a uh, a human nature um, all things were made through him now th th uh, this is important because only God is the one that creates things all things were made through him and through him was not anything made that was made well God is saying all over the Old Testament that he's the one that's made everything that's why the early church started seeing things like this Said, so, wait a minute but somehow he's God in him was life and the life was the light of men now God is life God is the one that's life uh, no human being, not Moses, not Abraham, nobody else spoke of themselves as being life. But here, um, this word somehow, this word that is God, it says, uh, and the word was God, um, somehow is life. And it's the light of people. Well, God is light and God is life. The light shines in darkness and darkness has not overcome it. Uh, we'll leave that, that one. That's, that, that'll take us. Um, but that, um, anyway. But this alludes you back to Genesis, where remember there was chaos in, uh, in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void. And then there was order out of the chaos. Um, that's what the light does. God said, "Let there be light." Um, all this is an allusion to back then, as He is He is the source of life. Um, if we go to so so we stick with this. This this word is well. Let me show you here. Um, if you go to the click here in interlinear. You don't have to look Greek, just uh, you see here the transliteration logos. What's going on with this? Um, and you, you can see where um, you can follow it throughout, but essentially it means um, wisdom. It could just mean uh, a word. So you have to see it in the context. You see how it's, it's done. Um, but most people agree that the scholars that this has to do with wisdom or the uh, sort of emanation of God. So let's see. So if we go to 1 Samuel, again, we're just doing an overview tonight just to um, get some terminologies down. Go to 1 Samuel 3. Um, and right away, remember the Samuel and Eli. And, well, I'll read it here. It's just a few verses. So it says, uh, Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. So typically when we see this, and you also have to take it in context. Uh, well, most of us understand by that that the word of the Lord, when the Lord, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, to Jeremiah, to Isaiah, um, 
that that means some kind of a vision or a prophecy. Um, but this is not a prophecy, right? And we're going to see something here. So, so just pay attention to that word. I was going to keep popping up. Okay. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. Okay. Um, so an experience with, with the Lord, that Lord, that the Lord is giving at that time, Eli, uh, whose sight, well, you remember, this, you know, the story, right? Um, he goes to the Lord, the Lord's calling to him. Um, and then verse four, then the Lord called Samuel and said, here I am. And, uh, and ran to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. But he said, I did not call you lie down again. So this is a second time. So he went and uh, lay down and the Lord called again. Remember, the word is the one that's coming to Samuel. And the Lord called again, but I don't know where the word, how the Lord got into the picture when we're talking about the word. It was the word of the Lord, but the Lord is the one that's talking. Um, and the word of the Lord called again Samuel. And Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And he said, Okay, lie down again. Verse 7. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. And the Lord, now he's serving the Lord, but he doesn't know the Lord. Um, by the way, this goes back to um, Exodus 3 when God says, you know, Moses said, what's his name? You know, well, who, whom shall I say? And they said, well, he tells him Yahweh, right? Or he tells him, Ehye, I, shed, Ehye, I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. Um, it says because they didn't know his, they didn't know him. They knew his name, but one thing is to know, another thing is to know, to be in relationship with. And that's actually key for what comes after in, in that sense. Um, so anyway, verse 7, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, you know, he's serving the Lord. Um, so he didn't have a relationship with him. He didn't, he was just serving. He didn't really know. It's like a lot of times we might be doing things, but we really don't have a relationship with God. We're, we're going over our parents' coattails, somebody else. Um, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. So is this an actual, but the Lord is speaking to him. So is it a prophecy, a vision, but he's talking to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, as, and, I, and he rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy, uh, even though it says it's the word calling him, but the word is coming. Okay, so therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place, and the Lord, now here it is, verse 10, And the Lord came and stood calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. Now it starts out saying that the Lord is the one that came to him, right? Verse one, but the one who's there is the Lord. It is the Lord. It's not, it could have easily said the Lord came to Samuel. It said the word came to Samuel. If we go to, there's a number of places like this, but we go to Jeremiah one, when God calls Jeremiah, there's something similar happens. Um, it says, now the word of the Lord came to me saying, uh, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, uh, and before you were born, I consecrated you, I appointed you a prophet to the nations. So the word of the Lord is speaking, but you know, that's just a thing. I mean, what does that even mean? Um, so we keep going. He's talking to him. The word of the Lord is speaking to him. Then I said, uh, ah, Lord God, now he's right. Uh, behold, I do not know how to speak. He's trying to get out of it for I'm only a youth. Don't blame the guy. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only you, for to all whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid. So if this is just a vision of something, you know, we got let's, let's take a look here. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Uh, then here, verse 9. Then the Lord, remember, it's the word of the Lord that came to him, right? Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the word of the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. The Lord is right there. He's, he is the Lord. He is the word. Uh, he's physical. He's right. He, the Lord reaches out his hand. It's not like a, uh, you know, it's not like the, the hands that they, that, that they saw over there in, um, what was that in Babylon? You know, many, many take it far seeing and they see the hand writing on the wall. Uh, you have been waiting to balance and your time is up. Um, so it starts off again, the word of the Lord, or in the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint, would be the Logos. Same thing that we saw in John 1. Um, this is elsewhere as well. 
that the word is not sometimes it could just be words but this is more of an expression and in fact um this this got changed after the first century but the, this wasn't um and it's been written about even by jewish scholars um that there was um as i said there was an emanation of god uh in the physical world so god is always you know think of him as the father uh, always in in heaven um but that he also had an emanation on the earth if we we were talking about genesis 1 we still talk about the incarnation but we've got to try to see where this thing comes from try to just get a basic um storyline so in genesis 3 you remember the serpent um fools the woman and the man by extension and the woman said to the serpent we may eat of the fruit she stopped talking to him that was her mistake you know instead of um making conversation with you know uh w with somebody that was contradicting god right um so he said you should not surely die and what god is going to do so now she's listening to him so all of a sudden verse eight uh and they heard so after they did what they did uh and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. Now, God is spirit, um, but he, he right. He, sometimes we see him as the angel of the Lord, for instance. Um, God is walking in the garden. Spirit doesn't make noise, right? Um, this appears to be more of um, what is called a theophany, which is not the, which is different. Well, I'll put these down in the future. Um, theophany is, is um, a form of God. So in the Old Testament, there was no Jesus. But we have the angel of the Lord. We have the word of the Lord. We have the Lord himself. By the way, when you see capital letters, right, in the Old Testament, that's the actual name of God, Yahweh, or if you want to use Jehovah, there's no J. That's the problem. There's no J in uh, in Hebrew. No J sound. That was that, that comes because of translations uh, early on. Um, m m most people pronounce it... Um, uh Yahweh some like other pronunciations but that's probably what it is um anyway they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden so here we go again this is this is the emanation of God God present right um in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife hid themselves so forth anyway at the very least this gives us maybe a clue that God would come around at the end of work day um and to have relationship to have fellowship to hang out to talk like just like a father does with their kids or in a mother you know uh what happened at school what's going on with your life um he knows but it, you know as people do things as kids do things you're you're trying to guide them you're trying to help them try to see where their heads are at um he wasn't surprised or anything obviously he already knew what was going on but he's he's talking to them like they're when you look when you read it like they're kids right uh he's talking to them and it, it and he says um but the Lord God called to the man and said to him, you know, where are you? You know, it's like, you know, they hide and go seek or something. And he says, I heard the sound of the garden. You know, it's like the kids. He said, who told you that you were naked? That's not like a parent. Uh, and then the man, all sons of man, it's not even Adam. You know, they call each other man and woman. Uh, the man said, the woman, the woman you gave me, you know, they all ratting each other out. Anyway, it's pretty pathetic. So anyway, this is the, the uh, I, I'm, I'll just reference this, but um, this would this would be more for the atonement. But this is the reason for the incarnation. Most people, when you say, "Well, why did Jesus have to come?" they say, "Because Adam and Eve fell." That's partly true. Um, it's not just Genesis three, though, because there's other falls, right? We have Genesis six. Again, we're just doing a survey just to get our feet wet for the incarnation, um, just to get some passages down, because there's a lot actually. Um, and this central to the God, this is a central core to the gospel. Um, but it's good to know the foundation so we know why we believe what we believe, right? It's supposed to just come in sort of like the end of the movie or, you know, I, I missed the introduction. I don't need it. No, you need it. That's what the whole foundation is. Uh, Genesis 6 also is part of this. It's not just Genesis 3 that Adam and Eve um, disobeyed, but also uh, we have Genesis 6, 1 to 4. Uh, this is a famous... Um, well, let me read it. When man began to multiply in the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, so some people try to say this was uh, Israel or something like that. There was no Israel at the time. Uh, this is probably heavily creatures. Uh, some disagree on this. Um, 
saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives uh, any they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man for So if it was just, you know, men marry women or taking wives, whatever, this happened all the time. Why would this be such a problem here when God says, then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh and he cut his days to 120. Then it says the Nephilim. So this is this is who we're talking about here. We're, we're not going to get into this, but this is this is in other places. This is throughout and same and is also throughout um, other cultures um, as well. Uh, they knew what this was. And by the way, this this continues on into uh, the second temple period between the Testaments. Uh, the Nephilim were on were on the earth in those days. Were on the earth like they're not human or something. And also afterward. When the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them, these were the mighty men uh, who were of old, the men of renown. So when you go to Second Peter and you go to Jude, and you see these these spirits in Tartarus, uh, they're enchained. You see them again in Revelation. You go like, what was it that they did that was so bad? Like, who are these particular spirits? Uh, this ties into that. Again, we're just uh, jumping around. Genesis nine. So the fall. You had the fall. Most people just say just to fall, Adam and Eve. But there's also this that happened, this, this atrocity, right? Remember, there's also a spiritual world, right? We're taking everything for ourselves, but it's also a spiritual world. And in this case, the spiritual world with humanity, right? That sin. Um, and then the other one, you have um, Genesis 11, well, 10 and 11. 10 being the table of nations. It's about 70 or 72 nations in there, which we see again in the book of Acts. Um, not strangely by design. Um, so here, remember the Tower of Babel? So, oh, by the way, this all ties in to what we're talking about. You, you may not see it yet, but, um, remember this is the Tower of Babel where they set out to build this huge tower, the ziggurat. There's, you can, I think I, I have one in, in the folder. Um, but they built this tower to go up, to make a mountain. The, what, what they would do in the ancient days is that, um, you will build a high altar. So a lot of times you see it, was, it says, um, they, they built a high altar. Most of the time when you see that, that's not good. That's not to God. That's to a God. Lowercase g. So they believe that the gods built, you know, lived up in a mountain where it was lush and it was touching the clouds. So they were veiled. That's why you see all the lightning and all the rain and the dew and, and the whole thing. And um, so they would come up and take, you know, fruits and vegetables and whatever um, and sacrifices and so forth. Uh, the nations did this. Um, here, this is what everybody's doing, except they're going, they're saying, Hey, this is a nice spot right here. We'll make our own mountain. We'll have this God come up there and we'll take our, you know, we'll do we'll, basically they want to control everything. They want, they wanted to sort of just tell God what he was, you know, how it was going to go and God disperses them and he confuses the language. If you remember when well, Acts one and two, if you recall, um, there's, there's this babbling of languages but it's understood. The whole thing is like reversed. Um, and in this case, people wanted to sort of make their way up to God somehow, you know, to take the, you know, their sacrifices to him, but they weren't hoping. God said, what are you nuts? I'm not, I'm not, that's, you're ridiculous. That's not going to happen. Here in the incarnation, that is God becoming flesh, God comes down. He said, I'll go down. Now, no God did that. The, the ones that you see in myth and mythology, you know, it's like Hercules or these other ones, um, it's, it's themselves. They're not taking on, you know, they can disguise themselves, but it's themselves. You know, they're, they're not um, doing what, what God did. Plus, you know, it's a myth. Here, um, the God of the universe, the creator himself, becomes as one of his creatures, um, which is astounding when you think about it. But um, anyway, let, let's... Um, let me uh, jump. I just want I just want to get some some passages in just so we get kind of warmed up for the for the series on the incarnation. In Philippians uh, two, chapter two. So this is one of scholars understand this commentators as one of the earliest passages of the early church is here, but it, that he uh, Paul is reciting it um, from verse six to eleven. And this is important because it tells us a lot about who this second person of the Trinity is. 
um, because it makes allusions to the Old Testament that we're going to see in a moment. Um, actually, it has some here, but it's, there's also more. So Paul says, by the way, he, we always have to read it in context, right? The reason that Paul brings this up is because he's, he's telling um, the Philippians to love one another, not to be conceited, to not treat others um, worse than themselves, but even better than themselves, to treat others better, right? So here, do not, verse 3, do, this is Philippians 2, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. And you're like, what? I'm not doing that. Uh, look after not only your own interests, but also the interests of others. And then he says, have this mind among yourselves. So consider, if you think that, you know, you're better than anybody or you don't want to do it, consider what Christ did. That's, what, that's where this comes in. So verse 5 is not part of the what is called the creed. This comes from early on, uh, the earliest, probably the first um, uh, a couple of years from the, uh, into the after the resurrection. Um, so he says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This is what you should know. And it goes like this. Th this is what he learned. Um, and they could tell this by the, the way is, the Greek is written and, and all this kind of, there's a lot of writings on this. Um, who the, so let's read it. So who though he was in the form of God, speaking of Jesus, he was in the form of God. This is also said in Colossians 2.9 and elsewhere. Um, and then you have to ask what, what kind of form. Um, who though he was in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, um, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men, in other words, becoming human. I'll just stop you for a second. Um, this here is known as the, this, this, this here, don't worry about where it gets techo, but it's, it's known as the kenosis theory. Uh, that's the Greek word for emptying. And there are Christians that believe that, um, that Jesus emptied himself. And then it, it, some of them say directly, and others, you know, I think it's just out of ignorance. They say that Jesus emptied himself of all his glory and all his power. Um, that's impossible because God cannot empty himself of his glory, right? Uh, God cannot change uh, his nature. It's, he is who he is. So, um, you know, I, I, I know what it means, and I've even said it, you know, in the past. It's more like, you know, for poetic structure, you know, it's like... Um, you know, he, he, he left all his glory behind. He left all his, you know, his majesty and his power. Uh, no, he did not. Um, what he, and it doesn't make, you have to read it in context with other passages. What he did was he did not use it to the fullest. Remember when he, when he, when he uh, I think it's in Luke, when they come get him uh, in Gethsemane and Jesus says, um, if I want to, I'll call, I'll, I'll pray to my father and, and he'll send 12 legions of angels. Well, the Romans, didn't even, I think they only had two legions in the area, maybe three at most in the whole region, um, which were typically around 6,000 soldiers, depends. And he's saying, I'll, I'll, I'll raise this place down. He says, it only took one angel, remember, it only took one angel in the Old Testament to rout, I think it was 187,000 uh, Assyrians. So um, it's overkill. Um, so it wasn't that he didn't have power. He was right there, but he subdued himself for the purposes of, I'll say it my way, of not cheating. Uh, and the reason is, if Jesus came, if, if the Son came, we say Jesus now, right? Because um, and when we say Jesus, we mean the, the second person of the Trinity um, and his um, divinity and his humanity. But sometimes when we say he didn't know something, or maybe he, or did he, or did he suffer, or he died, did he eat, was he hungry? We mean in his humanity, obviously. God doesn't get hungry or you can hurt him like that. Um, anyway, G G let's keep going. G Jesus restricted himself uh, to the plan. And the reason I say he couldn't cheat is it because if he did it under his own power, then he came for nothing. He had to do it as a human being to restore uh, not just what Adam did, but to do things the right way to God, to present us wholly to God. And there's a number of passages to this. Um, but this one, of course, so let's go. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So he said, all right, I'm God, but I'm not going to, I'm going to leave that to the side. Um, uh, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, right, so now he's more explicit. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
Uh, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. And we want to talk about that. What is this? So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, there's a whole bunch of things in here that, um, well, let's, let's just take this one. Uh, the name above every name. And it says, so that the name of Jesus, well, he already had Jesus. Uh, and so um, some believe what this is actually referring to is not Jesus uh, because he already had Jesus. Um, but the, what's the name above every name that we talked about before is Yahweh, that he is Yahweh, that he is, that he is God. Um, if we go to, I believe it is Isaiah 53, 45, um, again, we're just skipping around. We, we, we're just trying to get some passages in. So don't worry if, if, if it's a little disconnected. Uh, the more you hear it, the more and the more you see it. I, I think it, it makes more sense. Um, okay, so there's a number in here, but if we go to, um, I think it's 23. Yeah. So here, uh, Isaiah 45, 23. This is Yahweh, right? The Lord. Um, By myself, I have sworn... From my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. So this is like Isaiah 55, 8, 11, or 10, 11, just as he sends the rain or the sun um, to accomplish, you know, on the just and the unjust to accomplish his goals, it will now return to him void. He says, you can bank on this. He says, to, so there's the quote, this is Yahweh. <coughs> to me, every knee, to me, every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall swear allegiance. This is what Yahweh is saying. But we just read, let's go back. I should have had, well, I'll do this later, side by side, probably. Philippians 2, Yahweh says, he said that. Um, verse 10, Philippians 2, 10, so that at the name of Jesus, but he said at my name, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, it was Yahweh. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So early on, the, the church understood that somehow, somehow, Jesus was to be, you have to see it from the point of view, the Jews, they don't believe in two gods, so they didn't see it as two gods, but at the same time, somehow, he's Lord, he's God. Um, there's more to this in here, but... Um, Let's, uh, let's skip around. Uh, here's another one. we got a few minutes. If we go to Colossians, uh, we'll do one first and then we'll go to two. So in Colossians, this is, this is uh, famous here in verses 15 to 20. It's speaking about Jesus. Okay, and we're going to be fleshing all these out because there's a number. This is, this is central to who Jesus is and what our understanding of him is. So this is about Jesus. It says, He is the image of the invisible God. Remember, we talk about emanations in the Old Testament. Um, the Word. We started with John 1 1. What is the Word or the Logos? Um, the Jews at the time, they no longer believed that, but they, they used to believe in a representation of God. God emanated Himself somehow. A uh, representation, uh, a visible representation on earth. He is the image, right? Kind of like the copy. Um, or representation of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And some take this to mean that he was first created, but that's not the word that's used. It says, there's a phrase um, that's, that's in different places, even in the Old Testament. It could have said uh, first created. It doesn't say first created. It's firstborn. Um, if somebody's interested, we could go into that. Jehovah's Witness harp on this, but it's easy to debunk that. Um, for, we're using passages of scripture, not even going anywhere else. Uh, verse 16, for by him all things were created, even though God says Yahweh in the Old Testament, he's the one who created all things. And heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. So that has to do with um, the spirit world, right? The celestial world, not just the visible world. We're the, we're the visible world, the two realms. Where the thrones or dominions, so this language is right, like Roman and Greek language, um, but it's understood to be, you know, the powers. 
spiritual powers, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. I thought they were created for God, but they're created for him. And he is before all things. Um, but Yahweh is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. Hebrews 1, 3, we'll go in a second. Well, uh, and he is, let me see what time. And he is the head of the body, the church. So it's clearly Jesus that we're talking about. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, definitely Jesus. Because if you go to Revelation 1, right, he says, I was dead and now I'm alive. Just when you think he's talking about Yahweh, which he is Yahweh, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Well, all the fullness of God is his nature. Um... And through him, that's why the Jehovah's Witness, by the way, well, let me finish this. And through him to reconcile to himself all things. Well, God is the one that's reconciled himself, everything. Whether on earth or in heaven, that is not just a physical world, but the spiritual world, making peace by the blood of his cross. So it, it, this, is, this is a central message. This is the atonement. So remember, you have the incarnation, the atonement, and the resurrection as a triumvirate or a trident um, um, for the, the core of the gospel message. Um, I'll just keep jumping around. Let me just let's go to Hebrews 1 3. These are all key passages for who Jesus is. His pre-existence, his power, his creativeness. Um, verse 3, speaking of Jesus, says, He is the radiance of the glory of God, and the exact imprint, or here representation or image, um, of his nature. Well, who could be the the imprint or the exact imprint or representation of God's nature. Not us. We have a human nature. Only God. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Or the power of his word. Well, who holds the universe in existence? That's only Yahweh. But it says that he does. Jesus does. After making purification for sins, that's the atonement. Which we, have, we, we haven't spoken about. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He took his place. Uh, who can who can sit there? This is this goes to Daniel seven thirteen and fourteen. This is this is what got Jesus uh, sentenced by the high by the high priest. Remember, he says I, I he says I am. He says Are you the son of the blessed one? He says I am, and you will see the son of man coming on the clouds. And he, he, they just went after him. They knew exactly what he was talking about um, because that that's what he does. He comes to judge, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Uh, why inherited? Right? This is why he had to do it as a human being, to triumph as a human being. Um, let's do... Uh, oh, well, I, I skipped one here. Well, there's a number of these. But if we, we're in Colossians, if we go to the next chapter, verse 9. Um, so this, this is pretty concise. So speaking about Jesus. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. The whole, de the whole fullness of deity. The, the deity is God. God doesn't have to be God of, you know, our God. Deity is just God. But, you know, obviously, um, they don't capitalize it here, but these other guys, don't, the Greek doesn't do that. Um, but clearly, this, this is talking about Yahweh, the Father. The whole fullness of deity, of God, dwells bodily. So, he's, he's there. Um, um, we have the Holy Spirit that resides in us. Um, but not in, not in that sense. So there, there are a number of passages. If we, if we go, um, I mean, we could keep going, but if we, if we let's just round out. If we, if we come back to Genesis one three, I uh, Genesis one three, it is referring to Genesis, but uh, John one three. Um, here in verse three, remember it says, "In the beginning was the Word." This is referring back to Genesis. Uh, scholars pretty much agree across the board that this is what it's doing, is 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 saying who was in the beginning. This Word, this Logos, this wisdom this emanation of God, and that word or that, you know, that Jesus, you know, we, we go backwards, we, we fill in the blanks, was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Actually, uh, can't help myself, let's cheat a little bit here, just jump ahead. John 17, 5, says, this is a part Jehovah's Witness don't read to you. They'll read, they'll, they read this one, John 17, 3. There's a priestly prayer before, um, Jesus uh, uh, is ending his time on earth. 
And he says, and he's praying to the Father, he says, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. So they say, oh, the only true God. So Jesus, Jesus is not true, right? Uh, there's a number of answers to this. And you got to tell them, keep reading. The, 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 um, the um, phrase, or the, the um, paragraph hasn't ended yet. He's still talking. They want to stop him right there, but he has to say, amen. So it says, verse 4, I glorified you on earth. This is Jesus talking to the Father. Having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. So now he's saying, I finished everything you gave me to do. So I I glorify you and have me accomplish everything you gave me to do. And then there's a key right here, verse 5, John 17, 5. And now, Father, in other words, now is your turn. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Or with the glory I had at your side. Um, take your pick. How could that be? How can Jesus have had glory with him? And in case you're wondering, if you go to uh, Isaiah 42, 8. This is Yahweh now. I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. God does not share his glory. Um, he does not just say that once. Isaiah 48, 11 says, For my own sake, not for anybody else's sake, for my own sake, for my own sake, said it twice, I do it, for how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. Remember that, my glory I, I will not give to another. But Jesus in John 17, these are all key passages, by the way, uh, for the deity of Jesus. And um, the Jehovah's Witness always bring you here. Others, not just Jehovah's Witness. My glory I give to no other. But John 17, 5, they never want to bring you here. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Now, if God does not share his glory, and Jesus here says, I, my glory which I had with you, so we shared glory, it's the same glory. God doesn't have two glories. It's the same glory. So if that's the case, then he's the same one that's speaking in Isaiah uh, 42, 8 and 48, 11. Um, go back here, John. Oh, we're done. Well, let me just read three. John 1, 3. It says, All things were made through him, that is Jesus, or this word, and without him was not anything made that was made. So remember that. Yeah. I mean, I'm yeah. um, I, I, I got I got uh, Elijah and Isaiah here. Uh, could, could you take a, two minutes, if possible, to try to summarize everything you should say? <laughs> So, or, or, or the main points that you that, that you are what, okay. What so, this? yeah, tonight's only an overview. Um, we're going to be doing this in the next few weeks. So, the, so the, you, you had think of an onion. I'll, I'll put up a, an image next time. Just think of an onion. Um, you have all these rings, right? If you, if you cut the onion in half, you have all these rings. At the center is the core. Think of, think of the center as the core of Christianity, of, of what we believe, what's important, what, what matters. The stuff on the outside could be like, should you wear, you know, put on lipstick? Should women preach? Uh, should you have this kind of music, that kind of music? Um, should you speak in tongues? You know, some people try to cram everything to the center, but it's not. So if you, if you pull these things out and put them in their proper place, um, what you have at the core, what's important, if, no, if you don't know anything, and you're 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 you want to know who you know what's important is is essentially three things so I, i'm just calling it a triumvirate or a trident you know like a three-pronged fork where you have the incarnation which is what we're talking about and the incarnation is a latin phrase for meaning in flesh taking on flesh um jesus the second person father son and holy spirit the divine person he was already a divine person with a divine nature he takes on a human nature. So he already had a divine nature. He was already a hum uh, divine person. And he took on a human nature. So Jesus was not a human person. He was a divine person with a divine nature. And he added, uh, when he was born in Mary, by the Holy Spirit, um, a human nature. That's what. We, so that's the incarnation. The second prong is the atonement, which means to become at one with God. Um, how do we relate back to God? The forgiveness of our sins is the work that Jesus had to do on the cross to settle to settle things, to take on our sentence. And then there's the proof of that is the resurrection, that he was raised on, on the third day. If he was not raised, the whole thing is a waste of time. Um, there's nothing. 
where, where as Paul said, I, I, I mentioned earlier, and it's a good passage to know, 1 Corinthians 15 has to do everything with the resurrection. Verse 19 says, if in Christ we hope in this life only, so it's okay, okay, let's say we believe in Christ, but we only believe in this Christ, in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. In other words, we're pathetic because it's a waste of time because there is no life uh, after this one. So just like in Mark 2, when Jesus heals a paralytic, he says, your sins are forgiven, right? Then he knows they, they brought him down to heal his legs, but he says, your sins are forgiven. And people are like, what? First of all, the only way I could do that is God. Nobody in the Old Testament does that except for the high priest, and it, wasn't, it was only for the people and for himself once a year. So, but Jesus did on his own authority. He says, I forgive your sins. And they knew that only God said that. They want to kill him. But he says, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins, which only God does, by the way. That's why they, they, that's why they want to kill him. Because um, they say, wait a minute, how, how, what are you talking about? He says, get, get up, take your mat, and get out. And the guy was hopping out of there. And they were like, oh, wow, this is crazy. Who is this guy? And that's, what, that's whom we're talking about. The incarnation, the God coming in the second person, right? First person, Father. It, by the way, first, second, third doesn't mean that the, the, the Holy Spirit is, you know, is at the end of the line. He's equal just like the Father. He knows what the Father knows. He loves what the Father knows. He's not better. He's not less. And what's striking, oh, we went back to the past two minutes. Anyway, what's striking is that the Holy Spirit dwells in us in believers. And yet we ignore him all the time. So um, we'll keep going next week. Okay.